Hi, and welcome to the Beyond Hourly podcast, hosted by Omni Bridgeway, one of the world's most experienced dispute funders and enforcement specialists. Our podcast series focuses on commercial disputes around the globe and innovative ways to maximize value for clients and law firms. Episodes of this podcast can be found on our website, www.omnibridgeway.com, and also on iTunes, Spotify, and other podcast networks. And we welcome you to subscribe to the podcast and leave us reviews and suggestions. My name is Justin McLernan, and I'm your host for part two of our podcast, Negotiation Strategies for Commercial Dispute Resolution, How to Set Up for Success. In this podcast, Clyde Bowman, Omni Bridgeway's Global Chief Investment Officer, continues his chat with our guest, Robert Bourdon, a senior fellow at Harvard Law School. In part one, Clive and Bob discussed what is a negotiation, why it can fail or become protracted, and Bob also gave some useful tips about how parties can prepare themselves for a negotiation to maximise the prospects of success. Just a reminder that this discussion took place last year before the COVID-19 pandemic and before the merger of global dispute funders, IMF Bentham and Omni Bridgeway in November 2019. In part two, Clive and Bob continued the discussion, beginning with the concept of positional bargaining. In our area, in um, conflict dispute funding, we see positional bargaining a lot, where one party starts high, the other side starts low, and the parties in towards um, some point in between these extreme positions. And that can often result in no negotiated outcome. You can see the parties become entrenched in their positions and neither side being willing to move. Bob, what, what do you see are the issues with positional bargaining? Um, what can it lead to and, and what are the alternatives? Yeah, so positional bargaining, I wish I could say it was just in your world, Clive. Regrettably, it's in almost all worlds. And it's, you know, it's, it's the classic stereotypical approach to negotiation, which, you know, starts when we're kids. You know, if you had a bedtime as a kid and your parents might have tried to get you to go to bed by 7, hoping that you'd be in bed by 8.30, and of course you aim for 10 p.m., you know, and maybe it ended up at 9 or 9.30. It's, it's a little sad to me to think that that model of bargaining persists all the way up to incredibly sophisticated parties, whether they be in biz- business or international affairs, or, um, but it does. Um, and, and the problem with the, that approach, um, again, is that it doesn't really get at the reasons why someone may want X million dollars or may want anything that they're kind of claiming. All it really does is put into motion a you know sophisticated dance of concessions. Some of the other kind of downsides of this, um, as you mentioned, right, is that there could be real escalation. And so you can end up with an impasse where in fact, if we were able to understand what really mattered to the parties, we might be able to come up with a really creative agreement. I think the other challenge of positional bargaining um, and, and is that um, it could lead to arbitrary results. So the arbitrary results, by the way, can sometimes be in our favor um, and can sometimes be not so much in our favor. There's a famous story of the very first um, movie that the Beatles were going to be in and their music producer negotiated with the a movie studio around the royalties that the Beatles would get. And the movie uh, producer thought, you know, I mean, sorry, the music producer thought, wow, you know, these are the Beatles. I am going to ask for a very, very high royalty. Um, and he asked for 7.5%. The movie company very quickly accepted because in fact, the movie company was prepared to give 25% of the royalties to the Beatles. Um, what we see there is because positional bargaining is so random, it's tethered to nothing, it can lead to really arbitrary results. And so, you know, and instead, um, what we really try to recommend is something 
um, that is variously called either interest-based negotiation or principal negotiation or mutual gains negotiation. Um, all three of those names um, all represent a really different approach um, where the idea is let's not look at positions, but let's understand what's driving each of the positions and is there a way we can meet the interests of both sides? So I can give you uh, an example involving a, a mediation I was involved in recently. Um, this was a family uh, that is um, trying to um, divide property between them. And there's a particular piece of property um, that one sibling really wanted to see sold within uh, two years of their parents passing away. And the other sibling wanted to be sold five years after the parents passing. So the range there seems like it's between two and five, and then you could have a battle and figure out, you know, somewhere in the middle. Um, but if you kind of dig in and learn what the interests of the parties are, one party, the one who wanted to sell earlier, was really concerned that because of climate change, the value of the property was going down each year. And therefore, they wanted to sell as soon as possible um, after their parents passed away. The other uh, sibling felt that they would just be not emotionally ready to let go of the property that quickly. Um, and that's why they wanted to hold on to it longer. Once you understand that, it's quite easy to craft an agreement where you basically say, okay, two years after your parents die, let's identify three real estate agents who will make independent valuations of the valuation of this property. We will take the average and put it in an envelope. Then in year five, when the other sibling wants to sell, if the value of the property has in fact declined, then the party that wanted to hold on to the property longer will pay the differential to the party that wanted to sell earlier. And if the property is the same value or has increased, of course, we'll just split the proceeds. The point being here, once we get at the interest, the idea of two, three, four, five, fades away because we can actually structure something that meets the interests of both sides. Um, and that's the real alternative to positional bargaining. And if you're a party who's faced with somebody else who is seeking to adopt a positional bargaining approach, how can you get around that and start exploring the interests that you're talking about? Yeah, really challenging if the other side is being positional or using kind of difficult behaviors. Um, I think there's any number of strategies. In most ideal world, I might be really direct with them and almost invite a conversation about, is there some other way we can do this? Now, let's imagine that that doesn't work. You know, then I think the next step is really deploying skills around at what we call active listening, but really trying to take each of their positions and dig in and try to ask them why a particular provision is important or why a particular position is important. And as you, they start to answer that question, you'll start to learn what some of their interests are. Now, let's imagine that they resist even that. Spend sometimes giving them a proposal and asking them, you know, help me understand why this doesn't work. Positional parties in particular love to criticize. So that gives you a real opportunity as they're telling you everything that's wrong with your proposal to learn what their interests are. Now, if none of that works, sometimes what I do is scan more broadly to say, is there anyone in that organization or maybe someone else on the legal team or maybe reaching the client in some way? Is there someone else that I can work through and around because a particular party is being so intransigent. Um, obviously, a move like that has to be done with care, has to be well considered, but at times that can be very effective. You mentioned that one of the strategies might be to actively listen. I I'm interested yes. to 
explore that a bit? Could you tell us what, what is active listening? Sure, yeah, by active listening, what we really mean is not kind of sitting there politely, you know, nodding, um, saying, aha, uh-huh, or thanks, or I totally understand. But really, it's an approach that, that uses a number of discrete behaviors for the purpose of making the other side, first of all, feel heard, secondly, to have their emotions about validated, and thirdly, um, really to, again, get at this idea of moving from positions to interests. And so the component behaviors of active listening involve paraphrasing what you heard the other person say in a way that communicates that you really heard them fully. It also involves asking open-ended questions of the other side. And when I say open-ended, I mean questions that don't lend themselves to a yes or no answer, but questions that are more like how or why or help me understand. And then the last piece of active listening really goes to what we were talking about earlier when we talked about emotions. And it's really kind of acknowledging underlying emotions or feelings that the other part of you might be expressing, but in a more in, indirect way. And, and the purpose of acknowledging emotions is to really help them feel heard so that they can move from being, you know, angry, anxious, upset, hurt, fill in the blank, to actually constructive at the negotiation table. By the way, I would say active listening to me is the kind of critical, most important skill of a great negotiator. I wanted to talk about difficult and or unhelpful behavior exhibited by yeah. parties. In, in our line of business, we can come across that sort of behavior often. And it sounds like active listening is potentially an antidote to that sort of behavior. But what, what sort of difficult or unhelpful behavior can people come across and in addition to active listening what what sort of strategies do you think can be employed to deal with it yeah i mean the the list of difficult behaviors unfortunately is long and i think what each of us experiences as difficult might really vary but common difficult moves can include strategies such as a good cop, bad cop strategy. So in other words, you have someone saying, oh, everything you say is totally reasonable, but my client will never agree. Certainly there's a whole bunch of, you know, interpersonal difficult strategies. So whether that is screaming, yelling, being condescending, tone, there's other kinds of really hard bargaining strategies. You probably see many of these constantly delaying, saying they have no authority, take it or leave it moves. And yes, active listening is a really uh, helpful piece in terms of what you might do. But in addition to that, rather than playing their own game, so that is to say, if someone's yelling at you, it's really tempting to yell back. We would instead say, is there a way that you can find something of value in what they're saying? and reframe that anger or yelling into some kind of a conversation about the party's interest. Sometimes I do think it is appropriate, particularly if the behavior is repetitive, therefore there's a lot of delay or escalation, to be explicit about the dynamic. So we call this a name the game strategy, where you're really kind of naming the observed dynamic and why it's not being constructive in the negotiation. Of course, there's always some danger in that because the other side might react poorly to it. But if you do it with skill, right, if you explain it as your experience of the dynamic, it's a little bit hard for them to fight on that. So, um, you know, again, in in a longer negotiation course, we spend many hours on this topic of how do you deal with difficult or unproductive negotiation behaviors. It's quite an advanced topic and always hard to do because usually when the other side is using it, using hard bargaining behaviors, we find ourselves already kind of irritated and less skillful than we might prefer to be. I think um, one of the keys 
is to not become irritated and to remain unemotional and objective. And, and also to work out what the appropriate reaction is. So something we see often is um, final demands. This is, this is our last position. And I think you can either react to that by saying, well, fine, we're leaving, or you can explore why they have that position and maybe do more of what you were talking about, which is to identify what their interests are and to try and get them into a dialogue around value creation. Absolutely. I mean, obviously easier said than done, but that's the approach. I just wanted to say a little bit about my own experiences. Yeah, I'd love to hear that. I did the week-long negotiation course with Bob at Harvard Law School in June, and it was taught with a mixture of plenary sessions, smaller group discussions and simulated negotiations. Each night we were given instructions, and then the next day we faced a counterparty who had different instructions and we negotiated uh, a particular factual scenario and then we went back into our smaller groups and analysed that situation and talked about and tried to apply the learnings from the plenary session and my experience was very positive it was extremely stimulating not only because of the energy and positivity of the lecturers but also because of the energy and positivity of the students themselves. And I I just wanted to mention two key takeaways for me in the context of of the work that we do. And the first is, and you've touched on this in the course of our discussion, the real importance of planning before the negotiation and not just coming along and thinking that you'll wing it. And that really involves thinking about the issues, what the alternatives are to a negotiated outcome, um, what are both sides' interests, what are the possible options, and they don't necessarily need to be at that stage of thinking about the options, things which you've analysed and you've definitely decided are going to, to work. I appreciated the importance of being free and thinking about all of the possible options, not necessarily ones which you think are ultimately you're going to proceed with questions to ask and what messages to send and as I found myself in the evening preparing for these uh, negotiations the next day it really struck me how useful it was to undertake that sort of details analysis and and that's something which you know I'm bringing to bear in my own life situations where as a funder particularly in Australia we are going to mediations and participating in in the strategies around how to achieve a a successful outcome for the claimant. And the second learning for me was what are the limitations of positional bargaining, which I said earlier is something which we encounter quite frequently in the type of dispute funding that we do, and how, how to deal with that and what is a different way of negotiating which ultimately has a real chance of producing a better outcome for both parties, focusing on ascertaining interests and how to create value. And those learnings, I think, are, are directly applicable to what, to what we do, which, as I say, primarily focuses on negotiations around the, the dispute. But as you said at the start of this discussion, Bob, negotiations occur daily and in respect of everything we do. So in the context of dispute resolution funding, there are negotiations around timetables and what's to occur in the course of the litigation or arbitration. And importantly, the negotiation process or the types of negotiations can often start with funding agreement that we enter into when we have a discussion with the claimant about the terms. So I found it a very valuable learning experience and I would recommend it to everyone who is involved in negotiations, which, as you said, is basically everyone. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's very nice to hear. I'm so, I'm so glad that you got this out of it. And, you know, it's interesting because if I think about myself before I took a negotiation class and then started studying and writing and teaching it, I also spent very little time on preparation and the way I prepared was... I mean, pretty limited. And so that insight that you had about preparation, I think, you know, on the one hand can sound obvious, but on the other hand, we're all so busy and 
we can kind of skip over that level of detail. You know, as you were saying, what are the messages I want to send? What is the impact that they're, that they're going to have? And yeah, I mean, your other point about positional bargaining, you know, it's such a part of so many negotiation cultures. And I think shifting that sometimes, you know, if someone takes a course like you did, Clive, and then it can be hard to go back and shift that as kind of the only person or one of only a few people who may have a, a broader or slightly new or different view of negotiation. But I think there are ways to do that. And, you know, and certainly in my work, I sometimes have the opportunity to really um, work within an organization to expose a broader set of people to this approach. And that can really lead to bigger cultural change because the more people who, you know, kind of have a sense of what's possible, the more people you have trying to shift from the positional to that mutual gains uh, culture. But, but I, I'm pleased to know that you are there trying to do that in your work. It makes me feel good. I am. Bob, thank you very much for this discussion. I've thoroughly enjoyed speaking with you. Same as well. Thanks for inviting me to do it. Well, that brings us to the end of our podcast for today. Thanks very much to our guest, Bob Bourdon, for joining us and sharing some of the theory behind negotiation, as well as some useful strategies and practical tips to prepare for a negotiation and set it up for success. You can access a transcript of this podcast on our website blog page. As I mentioned at the outset, episodes of Omni Bridgeway's Beyond Alley podcast can be found on our website, www.omnibridgeway.com, as well as iTunes, Spotify, and other podcast networks. And I invite you to subscribe and leave us your reviews. If you're interested in exploring third-party dispute finance and would like to get in touch, please feel free to contact me at jmcclernan at omnibridgeway.com or to provide any feedback, ideas, or insights you might have on topics we should cover on our podcasts. We'll be back soon with another episode. Until then, thanks for listening and goodbye. Goodbye.